blind tasting. And you'll see on the slides, uh, I put blind in quotes and I put tasting in quotes. And you might ask why. Why blind tasting in quotes? Blind because, well, we're not really, we're not doing this blind. It's not really like you can't see anything. I know um, some people think we go through the master sommelier exam and we you know, put a blindfold on, we can't see anything, we're fumbling around for glasses, and we come up with these brilliant ideas. No, we, we know it's wine. We're going to look at it. We're going to use all of our, our kind of, our entire experiential capacity. Um, our vision, our taste, our touch, our, our sound even, um, to really deduce what these wines are. And that's why tasting is in quotes, because it's not just tasting. And we can taste as a, an organism five or six things, depending upon your philosophy. Bitter, sweet, salty, sour, umami. Some people are claiming that fat is actually something you can taste. Maybe it's a texture, but it's a sensory experience on, you know, based upon your palate. So are we really tasting wine when we only have five things that we can taste? No, because that makes wine seem really, really boring. And as you'll kind of go through what's in front of you, you'll see there's, a, there's an, a flavor wheel, an aroma wheel. It's a lot more than five things on that wheel. Uh, there are hundreds of things. You know, we can taste five things. We can smell an, really an infinite number. You can smell the qualities of fruits. We can smell where they are in their maturation <laughs> phase um, or in their decomposition phase. Um, so that's why blind tasting is in kind of quotes. And to make it even more challenging, um, we're going to kind of put you into a little bit of a, an uncomfortable situation. We're going to pretend as you go through these wines, and as you kind of, we, we progress, if you want to pick up a wine and sniff it, that's great. I do recommend you hold off because there is food coming out a little bit later. Just one caveat there. Um, we're going to say, you know, you have six wines in front of you, which is very convenient because of the master summary exam. You have six wines in front of you. Um, but you have 25 minutes to get through these wines. So think like, okay, 25 minutes. I, I can accomplish a lot in 25 minutes. You know, some people can run... You know, three, maybe even four miles in, in 25 minutes, not me. Um, you know, you can drive a great distance in 25 minutes. It, it seems like 25 minutes is, is a lot of time. But when you start trying to break down a line, you start trying to think about what it is, where it's from, what makes it unique, why is it this as opposed to that, 25 minutes becomes very, very short. And it becomes very, very intimidating. Um, so that's about four minutes and 10 seconds per wine. And as you assess these wines, you'll notice drastic differences. You'll notice similarities. Obviously, they're all from the same region. <coughs> Can you pick up vintage? Can you pick up Dominic Craig Bride? A lot of us go through our lives, we taste, we taste wine, we know what we like, we know what we don't like. We even get down to a point where we can recognize a producer just by the aroma that comes out of the glass. But do we know why? And that's one of the great questions that going through the Master Sommelier program, um, you know, meeting so many people, talking about, you know, about great wines in the world, why is what, in the what you're experiencing in the glass, why is it there? Because everything in that glass is because of some set of circumstances in the vineyard or in the winery, the bottling decision, the shipping decision, the aging decision. It's all done deliberately. It's not really a lot of accidents, um, fortunately, anymore in the wine world. So this is what my basement looked like going through the Master Sommelier exam. You can see all of these tags represent a different wine, a different region. Um, I, as I got, I took the, the tasting exam six times. You know, on time number four, they came out with the Coravin, which changed my life because now I could basically taste all these great wines of the world. Um, but you could kind of see, you know, all the, the breadth of what I needed to taste and what I needed to study. You know, it, this is intimidating. You know, being able to deduce Loire Cabernet Franc from Bordeaux Cabernet Franc. Being able to deduce New World Merlot from Right Bank Merlot. And, of course, Cabernet Sauvignon is grown throughout the world. What makes Bordeaux unique? What makes it distinctive? The most important thing was the bottle of champagne at the top. Um, which I did open once I passed, um, so it's always important to remember to celebrate. But you look at that, and you look at the number of bottles, it seems like it's an infinite possibility of what could be in your glass. <laughs> but really, it's a, how, do we, how do we wrap our minds around that? Because we as creatures, we like to know what's, what we're experiencing. And this is why you know, blind tasting or deductive tasting or whatever you want to label it, this is why it's such a challenge. Because when someone hands us a glass, it doesn't tell us what's in it. Our mind wants to start to jump to conclusions. Oh, I recognize something. I recognize anything in this wine. And our minds are very powerful this way because we don't want to put into our body something that is foreign, is, is, has potential to kill us. We're, we, we are a civilized society, but we are still programmed as though we were running around 10,000 years ago, you know, gathering fruits and berries and nuts and things like that. We taste it. Is it sweet? Is it something we like? Yes, okay, it's good. Is it bitter? Is it something that might be poison? Okay, get rid of it. So we tend to jump to really intense, immediate conclusions, even though we're just starting to assess a wine. Um, it's not a parlor trick. Some people will say, oh, you, 
you taste wine and you come up with it and it's, it's guessing. Who's seen the movie, uh, was it uh, Bottle Shock? <laughs> Where they're in the bar and they, you know, they, all, the, you know, all the bags, it's like, oh, I know, it's, it's this wine from this vintage and this producer. And they pull it out, it's like, it's amazing. But behind the scenes, it's all a scam. It's not a scam. Um, the unfortunate part is tasting is a lot of theory. The more experience you have, the more theory kind of in your mind about a region, about a grape variety, the better you get at tasting. And of course, the more tasting you do, the better you get at tasting. But if you're not training properly, if an Olympic athlete is training improperly, if you're training for the pole vault all wrong, you might be training hard, you might be training every day, you might be going through a rigorous program, but when you get to the time to come up with you know, your performance, if you're not doing it properly, you're not going to be able to, to, to you know, get the gold medal. Same thing with wine. If you're tasting properly, if you're tasting um, and thinking back with your theory, thinking back to what do I know, what can I rely upon, thinking back to you know, your own personal history with wine. There's going to be some really strong personal engagement with wine. There's also going to be some things that are you know, much more foreign that needs a little bit more polish, so to speak. Um, but it's, it's thoughtful, logical, and deliberate. And it's a matter of observation, reflection, and then conclusion. And we have to really then kind of break these apart so we don't jump ahead to the conclusion. You stick your nose in the glass and go, I know what this is. You've eliminated the first two arguably most critical parts of assessing a wine and gone right to the conclusion. It's really easy. I've told myself hundreds of times what is in, I've told myself that's what's in the glass. And hundreds of times I've been wrong. Once in a while you get it right. Absolutely. But why do we do this? To communicate. Why do we do this? To understand our own palate better. Why do we do this? We can sit at the table and talk to everyone else and enjoy a similar experience. So what we're going to try to do is, again, kind of walk through these steps, uh, walk through observation. What does that mean? We're going to see it. We're going to smell it. We're going to sniff it. Um, and we're going to sip it. We kind of call them the, the four or five S's, depending upon wh whether or not you're going to spit out the wine. Um, there are buckets on the table. Some of you might see that as an abomination. I don't blame you, because um, these are delicious wines. Um, but if you do want to spit the wines out, absolutely. Um, it's part of the process. So don't worry about reading all this on the slide. Um, the most important part is, in sight, we're looking at the color. And color is a function of a bunch of different things. What are we looking at? We look at a wine, okay, it's really deep purple. If you look at wine number one, just because right in front of you, I mean, that color is intense. It is deep purple. Why? Why is that there? There has to be a reason why this wine is deep purple, almost opaque. So you think about it. It's a function of age. It's a function of variety. It's a function of winemaking. Younger wines tend to be more intense. Wines that are a little bit more modern, uh, maybe there's cold maceration, maybe there's um, you know, a, a much cooler temperature that the wines are being fermented at or being pressed at um, to retain a lot of that intensity of color. Um, in other regions, maybe you're co-fermenting different grape varieties that will chemically lock in color. There's a reason why color is important. Wine making, does the wine start to show a little bit of browning around the edges in addition to that in, you know, kind of intense color? If so, there's possibly some oxidation. Wine will go from this really intense color, or even a, a really pale color, towards brown. Everything in the world of wine gravitates towards brown. White wines will go from green or golden towards brown. Everything goes back because nature is oxidizing it, and give it enough time, it'll turn it back into water. Kind of, kind of sad, um, so drink your wine quickly. Um, but color is important because now we start to understand. We are building a logical case for what's in the glass. So we see wine number one, okay, we're going to probably assume it's a, a, grape, a grape with high pigment levels. It's a grape that probably is a fuller body because of that. Um, maybe a little bit of browning, so there's you know, probably some oak. This is just from looking at a wine. We're not going to base conclusions on it, but it's going to help us. Um, again, get into, whoops, going the wrong direction. That would be helpful. And here's a, a pretty good slide. Again, if you can't see it, um, this will be up on the YouTube uh, channel as well. Um, but you see on the left, purple. And you start to think, okay, what grape varieties out there can give you a really purple wine. Cabernet Sauvignon, Malbec, Syrah, shla, slash Shiraz. Um, you know, I mean, your world, the goal of the Master Sommelier exam when you're in that tasting room is to make your world as small as possible. So when you see something like that, you can rule out Merlot. Merlot tends not to get as purple as Cabernet. It can be really, really ruby red and intense, but it tends not to be purple. It's an interesting thing. How many, how many people have actually thought about you know, the intensity of youthful Merlot versus the intensity of Cabernet. Some of you, absolutely. Others, maybe not. Because when you look at the wine, you smell it, you taste it, and you like it. And that's great. Now we're starting to pick it apart. And if some of you walk out of here 
Um, thinking I'm never going to be able to enjoy a, a glass of wine again because there's so many things to think about. I apologize. Um, but it, you know, I think it's, again, it, it's, it's changing this rubric in your mind of, you know, just going from straight from glass to palate and that hedonistic uh, kind of thing. And it's starting to be a little bit smarter. This is overkill, but um, Lynn wanted me to include it anyways because we drink other wines besides Bordeaux. Um, and I think this is great just to see, like, the whole spectrum of wine colors going from the palest of rosés all the way down to the deepest of tawnies. Um, and this is just, again, half of the world of wine. So why do we look at wine? Why do we not do this blindfolded? Because we need to eliminate half of the world of wine. We've eliminated all white wines, and now we're only focusing on red. So we get back to what can we smell. And I put up there everything because, it's, one, it's a little cheeky, but we really can smell everything. If there's something out there, you can smell it. You think about it. I mean, we can smell rocks. You can smell plants, you can smell flowers and trees and inorganic and organic compounds. I mean, this really is it. So uh, most of you will see um, a flavor wheel <clears throat> or an aroma wheel uh, on your place setting. For so those of you who don't, it looks like we have enough empty seats that we can take some off. We didn't quite have enough. So if you do not have an aroma wheel, uh, kind of raise your hand and we'll, we'll make sure there's some on this table. We can get them passed around. Um, but you look at it and then all of a sudden it's like, wow, this is terrifying. <laughs> I mean, look at all the different compounds that I could possibly get in a glass of wine. Um, but here's the pro tip. Keep it simple. Start in the middle of that wheel and then work your way outwards. Sometimes it's just a matter of identifying colors of fruit. Sometimes it's like, I smell something floral. I don't know what it is, but I smell something floral. And that's great because this is how we build these steps. And some of you might be like, I got it. I got floral, I got roses, I got violets, I got all, and they're, and they're a little dry. And that's, that's perfect because this is all based upon theory. This is all based upon experience. If you know what a rose smells like, that's great. But can you identify a rose in a, quote, non-rose setting? You stick your nose into a glass of wine. You don't expect to find roses. But when you start to you know, kind of train your brain a little bit more to think about, okay, experientially, pull myself away from it, you know, kind of have an out-of-body experience, if you will, and try to think about the wine in very kind of simplistic terms and think about what, is, what am I really getting out of this. So now we take a sip. I don't want to deny any of you a sip of wine if you haven't had one yet, so um, you know, certainly pick one. Don't, don't sip all of them, because um, we, won't, we won't want to save some for a little bit later in the program. Um, but take a small sip. One of our first instincts, we come home after a long day of work, we pour ourselves, I pour myself a giant glass of wine, and I just take a big old gulp of it. And that's, that's cool. Um, it gets the job done for sure. Um, but how much do I really appreciate that? How much is just almost a reflex of like, wow, my, it's super stressful and I need something just to calm down a little bit. And then the second sip, okay, I'm a little bit more calm, a little bit more relaxed, I can appreciate it more. But take a small sip. Work it around your mouth. It's more than just flavor. You want to pick up texture. You want to pick up um, all the tactile experiences in this wine. You know, we've already taken a, a sniff and we've, we've, we've started to think about all these kind of things going on. But now we want to sip. And we want to just... This is something to practice as well. If, you know, some of you might be more proficient at it than others. But inhale a little bit through your mouth. Draw oxygen, draw air over the surface of the wine. So you're almost aerating it in your mouth. And again, it's a little bit challenging for those of you who aren't quite as good as others. Um, but this is something you can practice in the shower. I've done it before. Um, so if you choke, um, you're not spitting wine everywhere. It's just, it's just water. But um, what you're trying to do is trying to get the retronasal effect here. Um, because, again, we can smell everything, we can taste five things. So what we're trying to do is engage our nose in the tasting process. So getting that oxygen in, you chew on the wine a little bit, you, you kind of work it around your mouth, you're getting the texture, you get more aromas, and then you, I, I like to exhale out of my nose. Um, so that way I'm making sure I'm getting all that air in my mouth out through, the, basically through my nasal passage, so I can smell the wine again. And now I can start to put together these different pieces of what's in the wine, of what's in the glass. And now I'm starting to build upon uh, you know, this theory that I have. You know, I've seen the wine, I've smelled the wine, I have some ideas about the wine, um, and now we're going on. Um, spitting, again, if you, if you want to, that's great. Uh, there are buckets on the table. Um, some of us have busier days than others, um, and you're trying to get through a bunch of wine. Um, and I said a bunch of wine. This, is, uh, this was a day where I tasted 350 wines trying to come up with a, a, a buy-the-glass program for a national restaurant chain. So 350 wines, trying to come up with 32 wines. There was, 
if I had tried to not spit through this day, I would have been done after about 20. Um, as it was, uh, the Uber ride home was very interesting because the Uber, I think, was moving in different directions than it actually was. Even after a lot of wines, you still get the contact buzz. It still starts to wear on your palate. Um, so that's why spitting can help, again, prolong the experience. Um, at a dinner, at a lunch, not, not necessary at all. So now we savor the wine. We think about it. We let the wine just kind of wash over us. We let all of our senses become involved. We relax, and we start to, okay, what's driving this bus? It sounds really simplistic, but what drives this wine? What makes this wine unique? What makes this wine special? Is there something in this wine that stands out more than everything else? And for those of you who have wine number one, uh, I'll just pick on that again because it's right there. Um, what's driving the bus in wine number one? Yeah, tannins are driving the bus here. Uh, some red and black fruit are driving the bus here. Um, we want to keep it simple. We don't want to say, oh, this is methoxypyrazine uh, you know, driving the bus, because everyone at the table looks at you and goes, what the heck are you talking about? If you look at the back of the wine folly, um, you know, if you have that uh, uh, aroma wheel, you'll see what they call impact compounds. Yeah, this is really a um, nice dinner conversation where you're talking about rotundone and methoxypyrazine and uh, terpenes and all that kind of stuff. It's like, I don't want to drink any of that stuff. But you kind of do, because they represent certain things. Um, but talk about it simp simply. And then you can start digging in. Okay, I'm getting red and black fruit. What kind of red and black fruit? Okay, what, okay, now that we've gotten into maybe blackberries and raspberries, what kind of blackberries and raspberries? Are they fresh blackberries, fresh raspberries? Are they dried black blackberries? Underripe blackberries? I mean, you start to kind of peel away the layers, and all of a sudden it becomes really a lot more complex. But you, don't, you can only go, you only go as far as you feel comfortable. Don't feel like I have to understand what a dried raspberry versus a, a crushed raspberry or a fermented raspberry or raspberry jam or raspberry pie filling, um, what the differences are and what they mean. If you can get to raspberry, that's great. If you can get to just red fruit over black fruit, also great. In fact, you can pick up on tannins. Um, also, hugely important. We'll get to that in a second, but... What I want to talk about quickly, again, I apologize for those in the back uh, not being able to see this, but primary, secondary, and tertiary flavors. <coughs> again, putting kind of a little bit more scientific terms on wine makes it seem really, really unsexy, um, but we want to think about, okay, primary aromas. Fruit is what wine is made from. Grapes, you know, most of the time. Primary aromas are going to be coming from fruit. So that's going to be things like, again, your blackberry, your raspberry, your cherries. Secondary. This, what's the next thing that has to happen in order for fruit to become wine? Fermentation. So we have to go through the process of fermentation. What are the aromas that are caused by fermentation? You know, things like you know, lac you know, lactose, um, you know, things like sour cream and buttermilk, uh, more for white wines. You go through malolactic fermentation. Um, and for red wine, maybe it's carbonic maceration. Maybe it's a little bit more of a bubblegummy kind of thing um, that you'll find more around Beaujolais. Uh, beer smells, yeast, things like that. Things that are distinctly linked to Saccharomyces that yeast that goes through and converts all that sugar into alcohol. And then our tertiary aromas. This is coming from oak and oxidation. So once fermentation stops, you can drink that wine, absolutely. But if it's a wine of quality, if it's a wine of pedigree, you're going to move on and put it in smoke barrels, or maybe you're going to put it into a tank for a number of years, um, and, you know, and then in the bottle for, for a period of time after that. Those are all the aromas, tertiary aromas. So it's important to think, when I smell these things in a wine, when I smell something like... Uh, Vanilla. Is that primary? No, it's not. It might be driving the bus, but is it a primary aroma? No, it's actually a tertiary aroma. It's coming from oak and aging. But that's important because in order to get to tertiary, you have to have other things involved and you have to have a certain level of quality. So now, again, we're trying to logically progress through wine. We're trying to make it as simple as possible. Uh, again, kind of a bit more technical, but thinking about tannin, we talked about you know, wine number one being massively tannic. Um, there's a lot of structure here. There's a lot of power. Um, absolutely. We can rule out a lot of kind of your, your moderate to low tannin grape varieties. Not necessarily all of them because you can augment tannins in a moderate grape variety like Merlot or Carbonier with oak. So you get some wiggle room here. But if you taste vanilla on wine number one and you taste these tannins and um, you can, again, kind of eliminate Pinot Noir and Gamay. You can eliminate a lot of these things. Obviously, we're eliminating because we're in Bordeaux. Um, but we're going to start to think about, okay, why is this here? What? Okay, this is a region that has money. Oak is incredibly expensive. 
if you add on average, uh, you know, a barrel of wine is about you know, twelve hundred, twelve hundred dollars or so. You get twenty-five cases um, of wine out of a barrel, so that's about um, what math is hard right now, but uh, forty-eight dollars per case for a barrel, four dollars a bottle, just on oak. If you're using new barrels, it's a lot of money when you think about the route to market and the markups that then have to be made. So that $4 in the winery cost, by the time it gets to our shores, is probably around $20, just if you're using oak. You know, it's okay. There has to be a region that can afford oak, that can afford uh, to put oak on it, that the, con that the consumers at the end start to understand. Outstanding. This is oak, is what it means. Alcohol. Again, this is, the, this, is the, you know, this is what makes wine wine. This is what separates it out from grape juice. Um, we start to think, okay, you know, global warming, global climate change, um, whatever you want. The winemakers are telling you that their vineyards are acting differently, the grapes are ripening diff differently. We're starting to see alcohol creeping up. We're starting to see ripeness at levels that we haven't been familiar with before, regions that haven't been able to enjoy that. So we're starting to see this kind of pushing up. You know, we're kind of almost redefining medium at this point, um, even maybe you know, 13.5. That used to be you know, pipe dreams you know, 50 years ago. Unless it's the best vintage. Now, 13.5, a lot of winemakers can get in their sleep. Um, but you start to think about, you know, is, this, is this high alcohol? If it is, it has to be a combination of a grape variety that has a long growing season because you need a long growing season to get more sugar accumulated and then convert it to higher levels of alcohol. Or it has to be a grape that just you know, can thrive and kind of give off you know, sugar like it's nobody's business. Um, it doesn't have to be, it can be like a really vigorous grape, something like Zinfandel. Something that just produces sugar without even without even trying. You can do you can do cool climate infidel and still get lots of alcohol. How yes, do you question. assess the level of alcohol in wine? So the question was, how do we assess level of alcohol? And this is where you know, blind tasting gets very, very challenging because we all have different physiological responses to alcohol. Alcohol is an irritant. You drink too much of it, it burns. Some of us can feel that burn. I start to feel alcohol kind of moving down my chest. You know, around 14%, I can kind of feel it right, you know, right at the top of my sternum. 15, 16%, some of these kind of big, massive uh, California Cabernets or Amarone, something like that, I'll start to feel a burn almost down to my stomach. Um, so it's, you know, again, if you feel it in your mouth, um, that's also you know, your own personal experience here. But it's how you calibrate it with what's on the label or what's in the bottle. Um, that's the key point. Because I'm going to experience this wine different than every single one of you. Um, but we have to find a way to come together, and I'm going to take my medium plus alcohol call of the wine kind of right here in the top of my chest and convert it over to, to lens. I feel this on the cheeks of my mouth and it gives me that burning sensation. <clears throat> but we're talking about the same thing. So it's a really a personal thing and experiential. Um, you know, taste a high alcohol wine with a medium alcohol wine and look for things like burning or tingling or spiciness or heat. That's, again, do we sip a glass of wine and start to think, oh, okay, what's the alcohol level? Which, what am I looking for here? Uh, not often. Yes, question. Yes, so the question was, how does alcohol uh, kind of affect the, the legs or tears in a wine? And that's, that's important because um, higher alcohol will actually, because alcohol, it's, we're a solution here, alcohol will bind with the glass. Alcohol is trying to evaporate, so it actually will stick to the glass and evaporate off of their, um, I forget the name of the principle, but um, there's a scientific principle that alcohol will evaporate off and it will give really thick tears. It'll give the impression of thick tears. Um, whereas low alcohol wine, something like you know, your German Rieslings at about 8%, um, even though they have lots of sugar, um, you know, will kind of weep down a little bit more quickly. Um, so absolutely, the, uh, the level of alcohol will affect the tears. And then also, as a kind of a, another great thing, alcohol is a solvent, um, not just for life's problems, but um, <laughs> that was kind of funny. Come on. <laughs> so alcohol is a great solvent. It will pretty much break down a lot of compounds over time. And what that does is during the fermentation process, if you have elevated levels of alcohol, what you're going to be able to do is dissolve more color, dissolve more pigment into that wine, which will then you'll be able to start to see in the legs and the tears, because this pigment has actually become so ingrained that it, you know there's just so much of it that it will stain the glass. So if you tilt the glass away from you and twist it side to side, um, you can almost see kind of almost a purple sheeting maybe on wines one and one and two. Okay, again, that's a function of youth. That's a function maybe of elevated alcohol. A lot of different things that this could be, but it's helping for us to come up with our conclusion. Acidity. 
probably the least popular thing for uh, kind of the assessment of wine to talk about because everyone thinks, oh, acidity doesn't sound pleasant. We don't want to think about drinking or, or you know, tasting acidic things. Um, but at, wine is an acidic beverage. All wines have pretty pronounced levels of acidity. Um, it takes a lot of practice for us as, as living organisms to, to enjoy wine because acid and bitterness are two things we generally run away from. They tend to indicate poison. They tend to indicate things that will break us down. But in wine, it's, it's wonderful. It's refreshing. It, uh, it, it helps a wine become balanced. Um, so you look at, you know, where is this wine? And again, acid's a very personal thing. Um, what, what I do in my perception of acid, I take the wine, I, I, I switch it around, spit it out, sip it. Um, I feel acid kind of creep on my jawline. So for me, it kind of like, I think about it like lemon, lemons. So like uh, you're kind of your really super sweet uh, lemon, lemon custard. Um, not a lot of acid there. It's very fresh, very lively, there's still some acid, but that acid just sits right here in the front of my mouth. The tartar the acid, the more sharp the lemon, um, the more it creeps up to the back. So high acid, I'll actually have like, I'll feel like my entire jawline either tingling or watering, depending upon the wine. And again, some of you are going to look at me and go like, what the heck is this guy talking about? He's, you know, the tingling and this is totally experiential. Um, one way you can kind of start to calibrate is if you think that, okay, what kind of fruit am I getting? Am I getting really super overripe black fruit? You know, stewed plums, uh, am I getting you know, blueberry pie filling? Think about all those things. Are they really acidic and tart? No. That's probably going to correlate with what's in the glass. If you're getting things like raspberries and sour cherries, cranberries, wild strawberries, things like that, those tend to be less ripe fruits or higher acid fruits. So you're probably going to get that expressing itself in the wine. So th that's another reason why we start to think about, okay, the quality of the fruit. What kind of fruit, what color of fruit, Red fruit tends to be more acidic than black fruit. So again, think about that and how it, it kind of hits your palate and alters your experience of the wine. So this was uh, Emile Penot. Um, he described the taste of wine in a triangle. And it's all about balance. You find these things in different capacities. And Eric sent this to me, and I, I, I sent the presentation back to him and said, I've ruined Emile Penot and his legacy because I've changed his triangle. Um, I've, I've taken sweetness away because a lot of wines out there in the world are not sweet. You know, Ninety-two percent of the wines out there, I'll, I'll estimate, are, are not intentionally sweet. Um, Eight percent, you know, there's a lot of commercial wines that are being produced these days um, here in the United States specifically where you have the ripeness um, to actually have 8, 10, 12, 15 grams of residual sugar in a red wine, in a Cabernet-based blend. Commercially extraordinarily popular but not really well suited towards kind of fine wine, if you will. So I've replaced sweetness with alcohol. Because I think this is actually a little bit more important because sweetness, the sweetness of the fruit on the vine absolutely is important. But in our experience, we're going to be basing this balance off of tannins, acidity, acidity, and alcohol. Because those are the things we're going to taste. And these wines, these all have about the same level of residual sugar. It's going to be maybe two grams, maybe three grams. That's not a lot. It's really imperceptible. They're all going to taste dry. But we will be able to perceive the alcohol. So this is a little bit more relevant for our experience. So we'll kind of, again, replace alcohol down here with, from sweetness. Um, it comes from ripe grapes and warm vintages. Now we start to put this together. Okay, I'm getting ripeness here. I'm getting alcohol. You can't get high levels of alcohol in really, really cool vintages, most likely. And it's going to showcase itself. You can get ripeness of the fruit. You can get physiological um, you can get that ripeness there. It's hard to get the phenological ripeness, which is going to be your skins and your seeds and your stems. You're not going to be able to ripen that out. So we go out into the woods, uh, you break a branch. If it's green, it doesn't really break, it doesn't snap. You, it bends almost. Same thing happens to grape stems. They don't get ripe enough, you can't snap them off at the vine. Um, they're really green. As the wood lignifies, all of a sudden you snap that twig, if you chew on that branch, it's going to be a much different experience. I know it sounds strange, but think about a toothpick then. You chew on a toothpick, that is fully lignified. There's, not, you know, there's really not, no greenness in that. Same thing with grapes. The stem becomes fully lignified. It doesn't give you that bitterness. Um, it, you know, the alcohol levels in the grapes are going to be higher, a little bit more pronounced. And that lignification actually adds to the sweetness. Because think about it. What are we going to age some of these wines in? Oak. Oak augment sweetness from the flavors, the flavor profile, vanilla, clove, nutmeg, cinnamon, all things we associate with sweet, not necessarily with savory. 
So again, we're looking for balance. Um, again, kind of sweetness and dry, not really applicable here um, for sweetness because again, if we we're talking about Sauterne, absolutely a conversation we can have. If we were doing a comparison of Bordeaux with Napa, we can absolutely talk about this because it comes into play. Um, body is much more important here. And body ties into alcohol. Body ties into ripeness. Body ties into oak regimen. Um, and also the, the inherent nature of the grape variety. Um, you look at you know, kind of the whole package, if you will. How much does this wine weigh? Is it something that's kind of thin and light and watery? I put this on the scale of kind of the dairy products. Skim milk to heavy cream. So start to think about, you know, again, we don't want to think about mixing wine and milk together, but think about it, roll it around your tongue. You know, we're all you know, kind of pretty familiar with like, oh, I like my coffee with X dairy product in it, or my tea with X dairy product in it. And if you don't have that, it just doesn't feel right. If you're used to having half and half in your coffee in the morning and you have it with skim milk, the coffee doesn't weigh the same. It sounds like a strange thing, but again, we're not just tasting, we're feeling, we're experiencing these beverages in, in a lot in more complex ways than we often give ourselves credit for. So now we're on to reflection. That was just the observation part. But that's the most important part, because if you don't observe something, then you can't really process it. Reflection. And this is the critical thing. Um, for those of you who will be sitting in Master Sunday exam in about you know, 15 minutes or so, don't let the wine tell you what it, don't tell the wine what it is, let the wine tell you what it is. And this is where snap judgments come into play. And I've sat with some of you uh, or some of your, uh, your members at a dinner and said, oh, this is absolutely this, this house or this chateau. And I'm like, like, I'm taking my pen off and giving it to you because I, I, I don't have that kind of capacity to like pinpoint a specific chateau. And I'm like super impressed with it. If I tried to do that, I'd be way off the grid. Um, but it's important that most of the time we're going to be tasting wine that maybe we don't, aren't as intimately familiar with. So we need to really listen more to the wine and not be kind of as judgmental. We want to bring the data in, let it wash over us, and then come up with a sound judgment. <coughs> so step two, um, we start to think about things like length and balance and acidity. Now that we know what it is, now that we know how to perceive it, we start to think about how it all fits together. Does the flavor linger? That's going to be the length. You know, what, what causes the wine to linger? Oak, tannins, acidity. Alcohol, glycerol, which is a byproduct of fermentation. The more alcohol you get, the more glycerol you're going to get. That can stay in your mouth as well for a longer period of time. Does your mouth water? Are you getting that really just kind of salivation? Like, wow, that was really kind of fresh and crisp and crunchy almost. Um, is there a warmth that creeps in? That's your alcohol content. Do your cheeks feel fuzzy? Do your gums want to kind of stick to your, to your cheeks? Um, does your te do your teeth feel fuzzy? It's going to be the tannins. And again, some of these things are a little bit more subjective than others. Um, the bitterness and astringency, extraction. Some modern winemaking says you have to let the grapes sit um, in a certain temperature uh, you know, vat for X number of hours before you can start fermentation because you're trying to get more color. Old school, more traditional producers, like I'm not, you know, I don't have this cryogenic stuff. I don't have stainless steel, um, you know, kind of everywhere. So my fermentation is a little bit more, you can call it rustic or you know, traditional. Um, and you're going to get a little bit more harsh, bitter tannins out of that. And then does the, what does the wine finish on? What's the last kind of note that the wine plays to you? And that's going to be the finish. That's going to be the, oftentimes the warm climate or the vintage coming into play. If it finishes warm and ripe, maybe it's coming from a warmer vintage. If it finishes a little bit dry and savory, um, maybe it's going to be from an older vintage. Um, if it finishes on fruit, it's probably going to be a younger wine. It's probably going to be something that's still, again, primary um, in, its, uh, in its infancy. But despite all of this, we can't lose sight of, do we want another glass? Do we want another sip of the wine? Do we want another bottle? Do I want to buy a case of this? Do I, want to, do I never want to have this wine again? We can't lose sight of that. Again, I, my job is to make things in, incredibly complex and then uh, remind you that it, it's, it's all about the wine. It's all about the enjoyment of the wine. It doesn't matter. Uh, if you can pinpoint tannin, if you don't like it, you know, great. I call this, you know, this, the acidity on this wine was medium plus. The tannins were high. Fantastic. You're great. But, but did the wine resonate with you? Did the wine speak to you? Did the wine, you know, change your evening, change your life? Is it a special occasion kind of wine? Um, does the wine make you happy? I mean, that's the one thing, again, if you do walk out and, and realize that you're struggling to really, quote, enjoy wine um, a little bit after this, I'm sure you'll all be okay tonight. Um, but don't forget that we're, we're here to enjoy the wine. 
So this is uh, the next couple of slides are all in the packet that's down on the table for you. I know some of the, the food might be coming down, but just some great profiles to think about. Um, so we're going to, you know, just for, you know, again, we're, we're keeping our world small. We're in Bordeaux. This is great. We have five grape varieties to really pay attention to. Six, um, if, if someone's still, there might be one or two producers still using some Carmen Air. Um, but just think about, what am I tasting? And this, again, being as simplistic as red fruit versus black fruit, can you taste something that's herbal? Um, this means a lot here in Bordeaux because these grapes are incredibly different. But because they're often blended together in small proportions, we, ass we assume they all kind of taste the same. But there are really distinct markers here for Cabernet. Black fruit. You're not going to find red fruit in Cabernet Sauvignon. It's just impossible. If you do, it's because it's not ripe. And then you're going to have problems with tannin and acid. Um, and then with age, these wines, again, can evolve. Your fruit starts to dry out. Things like mushrooms, soy sauce, umami, uh, leather, all start to come into play. That's a function of age. You don't often see these in youth. But we can see some things like bell pepper, which can confuse us and start to be like, oh, that's not fruit. That is a savory element because bell peppers are savory. They're herbal. Um, we often think that bell pepper is an indication of age. Not necessarily. Bell pepper can become more pronounced with age, absolutely. It's one of the compounds that does not break down over time very well or very easily. Um, so bell pepper is a, a pretty constant thing. It remains, you know, methoxypyrazines remain fairly constant throughout the life of the wine. So if you taste in its youth, it's going to become more pronounced, and it's probably going to be coming from one of the grapes that actually has it. Merlot, the other, again, kind of major grape in Bordeaux, moving to the right bank. Red fruit and black fruit. So again, if you're starting, if you taste in a wine, a blend of different fruit colors. It's because there's a reason. Maybe they're blending different grapes, absolutely, but maybe it's being led by a grape that is red and black fruit dominant. Things like cocoa, mocha, bay leaf, also part of the Merlot pedigree. You'll notice there's no bell pepper. Bell pepper is not in Merlot. It's a totally different kind of Cabernet Franc is the parentage that kind of brought uh, you know, green bell pepper into play in the Bordeaux, gave it off to Cabernet Sauvignon. Merlot came from a totally different ancestry. There is no, no pyrazines, no methoxypyrazine in Merlot. Very, very small quantities, if any. But it does have bay leaf and tobacco. So again, similar, but different. Think about what tastes different between a bay leaf and a green bell pepper. When's the last time anybody thought about that? Probably, probably never. Maybe never. But this is the kind of detail you can start to get in that will help you get a decision of, am I going to the right bank or am I going to the left bank? Am I going to a particular, again, region? Cabernet Franc um, didn't give it a whole lot of uh, a love here, even though it is, is the most important of the, the kind of the, the, this next tier of grape varieties. Cabernet Franc, for me, brings a lot of acidity. It's a little bit more in description on the, on the sheets uh, in front of you. But Cabernet Franc tends to retain a lot of acidity. It's a late bloomer early ripening grape. So even in cool vintages, even in short vintages where there's frost in the spring or autumn, Cabernet Franc is, pr is pretty consistent and brings bell pepper, floral, raspberry. Um, so when you get that in the wine, it's like, wow, there's just, it's really kind of crunchy red fruit is what I kind of describe uh, Cabernet Franc as versus that little bit softer, plusher, plumper red fruit out of Merlot. Or the jammy kind of, uh, uh, kind of bold black fruit out of Cabernet Sauvignon. Petit Verdot, again, used very sparingly. This is uh, kind of like hot sauce for me um, in the wine blend. It tends to be really spicy, tends to be really massive and powerful. You know, brings big color and big tannins. So a little bit goes a very, very long way with Petit Verdot. And then Malbec, um, again, used in small percentages, um, but because globally it's become far more important in the last 20 years, I think it's important to put it up there because it is, you know, you never know when you have a, a really ripe vintage and you just need something to take the edge off some of the tannins, um, some of the kind of the structure. Malbec doesn't really have a, 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 a lot of inherent structure, which is why Argentinian Malbec is so popular, because you can drink lots of it quickly. And it's you know, relatively inexpensive to produce, um, and it's just it's very, very easy going. But it can, it can soften out some of the harder edges, um, but it does need a warmer vintage to do so. Um, so again, this is, uh, I, I love Eric's slides because he thinks about things in, in ways that I certainly don't. Um, but this is just a chart of kind of average summer temperature in Bordeaux. You know, it's going up. 
So this is something to keep in mind as well. When you start tasting older wines, they're going to be distinctly different than some of these more youthful wines. Just because the temperature, I mean, if 82 and 02, you look at that, distinctly different in terms of what they represent now because the world has changed, because winemaking has changed, because the market has changed. Winemakers are aiming at different targets now. So we look at this and we, you know, it's like, can we even compare the wines of the, the 60s and 70s with the wines of, you know, the teens? I don't know. They're totally different animals. We can draw a lot of similarities for sure, but they're going to be totally different in their evolution. Um, and again, this is why I think, this is why I love wine, because every vintage is something new to study and experience. Um, but does, why does vintage matter? Um, if you're getting a really fruit-driven wine, if you're getting something that's loaded up on fruit, and there's not a lot else that you can kind of pick out, you know, that's important, because it's, what does it take to get lots of fruit, to get lots of sugar? In your grapes, it takes heat. It takes long growing seasons. So when you think about that, think about you know, these elements in a wine on a, on a, on a volume knob. I mean, a lot of us have stereos now, you just kind of push a remote and volume goes up and down, but I like the old school knob on, on, the, on the receiver. You turn it up, you turn it down, you really can fine tune in there. Same thing you can do with warm vintage, cool vintage. Warm vintage, you're turning the volume up on fruit. Cool vintage, you turn it down, and you're turning up the green elements. You're turning up those more savory elements. Um, earthy character is not going to, it's going to be fairly consistent, but it's going to be hard to pick up due to vintage variations. If you're getting a really big fruit-driven vintage, um, we are programmed to gravitate towards fruit. Again, that's just what we like. Do we like to taste things like dirt? Not usually. Um, but we like mushrooms and things like that. So as the fruit fades and the mushroom elements start to come up, we start to see them a little bit more. We're so focused with fruit because that indicates cheap calories, that indicates energy. Therefore, that's what we see. That's what we want to focus on. But if we start to pick it up, um, you know, maybe if we taste earthiness in a youthful wine, then it's got to be a cooler year because that earth, that earth can't really overcome massive amounts of fruit. So now we're into deduction. Now it's let your experience guide you. We've done a tremendous amount of work. Um, and again, this all has to be done in four minutes and 10 seconds per wine. Just became a lot harder now. But let your experience guide you. This is about your personal experience with wine. And your personal kind of, you know, how deep into theory do you, you know, do you know that vintage chart? Like Eric does. Can you talk about these vintages and uh, you know, when, you know, when precisely uh, flowering, harvested, when uh, veraison, uh, you know, wh when did all these things happen and what does it mean for the wine? Or is it just more about, okay, I know that 03 was, was kind of warm and tended to produce a little higher alcohol wine, so that's, that's about what I am comfortable knowledge-wise. It's a step in the right direction, but use your personal experience, use your personal resources. You know, to, I always say, I, I learn when I taste with people who are better at tasting than I am. I'm not a great natural taster. I love tasting with my wife. She just says things, and I'm like, she's not in the wine industry. She's an HR for a pharmaceutical company, and she's infinitely better at tasting wine than I am. It drives me crazy. But that's it. I want to hear what people say. I want to hear all these experiences that I am not privy to. You know, my, my wife, I'll pour her a glass of California Merlot, and she's like, oh, that tastes like communion growing up. I'm like, I didn't have communion growing up, so I don't know what that means, but I understand that concept now. I understand why people associate certain things. It's really a kind of a sociological experiment, the tasting wine. You learn, you experience, you share. Um, so again, deduction. Is it a warm, cool vintage? And then start to think about what might be that lead grape. Digging deeper, and this is all on the sheets in front of you as well, potential communes. Again, it might seem a little bit more intimidating for some, less for others. We're starting to think about, I just put together some cliff notes. What do I think about these communes? What do they deliver for me in terms of style, in terms of pedigree? Um, I, you know, my, a lot of my career is in restaurants, so I was trying to, you know, sell Bordeaux to the California wine drinker or to get, you know, the Bordeaux drinker to try California. So I started to think about, you know, okay, how do I get, you know, how do I talk about these, these regions? How do I talk about these places in terms of, you know, that are kind of globally accepted? I was like, okay, Santa Steph. Santa Steph is kind of like, you know, you're about to leave on a trip to Napa. You pack your shorts. You're ready to go. Um, it, can, it can be a little bit more muscular and, and kind of fruit dominant. Um, you know, Poyak, there's your thoroughbred horse. There's something that you know it's going it, to, it generally is, you know, the most long-lived structured wines out there. Margot is fragrant and perfumed and floral. I hate using the term feminine because um, it's, it, it's kind of, it's stereotypes in a way that I'm, I, I just don't think is appropriate, but it tends to be the most, you know, the most gentle, um, the most, um, you know, uh, just kind of 
erudite, if you will, um, experience of wine. Uh, so again, you find your own personal footnotes for these wines, um, and that's what you base it upon. You don't base it upon what I tell you, um, because then all you're doing is parroting what I say about the wine. It's, it's more about what are you experiencing, what are you enjoying. So, now, that seems easy enough, right? Everyone's super comfortable with this. Everyone's ready. So, you have six wines in front of you. Keep it simple. You have a, on, on the packet, there's uh, two pages, uh, sorry, three pages for you to take some notes. Scribble down. Again, keep it, you know, keep it simple unless you feel comfortable you know, diving in like, oh, there's something I really, red fruit, black fruit. Okay, yeah, red cherries, black cherries, uh, dried red cherries. Take it as far as you want to. Think about key components. Try to stay away from the fringes and the minutiae because you can, you can find something in any one of these glasses of wine. If I say, you know, uh, you know, green tobacco, all of a sudden you will find green tobacco. It's a very, very powerful thing. So try to take notes. Again, what's impactful? What are the first three things that jump out of the glass at you? What makes this wine different than all the other wines on the table? Think logically. Don't be afraid to be bold. A lot of times in the wine world, we don't want to take that chance, that leap, because we're afraid of feeling foolish. And I don't know why it's just wine, but you know, people are like, I'm afraid to give my opinion because I don't want to sound like I don't know what I'm doing. Um, I don't think that's the case in this room, because I think everyone is here for a reason, because of their love of Bordeaux. Um, so be bold in your, in your deduction. You know, if you think this is a 70-year-old a, a Bordeaux, fantastic. Great, say it. It's 1945, Lafitte. We weren't supposed to pour that? Okay. But no, but, but think about it that way. Like, don't, don't let your mind constrain what you think this wine might be. You know, we poured some great wines today. I'm really excited about what we put together. You don't have a list of those wines yet, because that would be cheating. Um, so does everyone feel good? So, that being said, 25 minutes. Because everyone's kind of completed their first course, right? This is perfect. Everyone's going to come around. This gives you something to do while they're clearing the plates. You get to fill that lull in the meal with coming up with what these six wines are, where they're from. And again, be bold. Call a producer. You get extra points for that. Yes, another question. Are they all the same format? Can you talk a little bit about aging? Yes, so the question was um, about the format. Uh, these are all out of 750s. Um, so the effective format on aging. So... Again, this is another element. Big bottles um, tend to have, uh, they do, they have less area for oxygen to come in, uh, first of all, in, in terms of the volume. And secondly, there's less surface area in that wine, in a big bottle, that uh, oxygen could dissolve into the wine from. Um, so it's, big bottles tend to age a lot more slowly than small bottles. Um, you know, again, it's, we're sealing everything with a piece of tree bark, unfortunately, um, which then kind of changes that um, paradigm a little bit because each cork is then incredibly different. Um, and you can have the best quality cork in a 750 and have it outperform uh, a Nebuchadnezzar um, sealed with, a, a, again, kind of a lesser quality cork. Um, so age will generally be slowed down in large format bottles. But for today, these are all 750 milliliter bottles, um, and they were opened at about 11 o'clock, give or take. So it's coming up on uh, about two and a half hours. Yes, another question. So wine four, for the short pour, the pour. This, this gentleman uh, asked about wine number four being a short pour. Um, he's gaming the system because I'm not going to give away the answer um, if it's an older wine or not. Um, but we did have two bottles that were flawed. So I won't say how they were flawed, but they were flawed and not pourable. Um, that can happen in a young wine or an old wine, uh, but we do not feel comfortable serving that, so there is a little bit less of wine number four. Any other questions? Best of luck to you all, and don't forget, just enjoy it. <laughs> Personally,